I'm Arielle Gold, and I'm our I'm the Fellowship of Reconciliation UA's Executive Director. The Fellowship of Reconciliation is the oldest peace and justice organization in the United States, and we are part of an internet network uh, with over 50 chapters around the world on various continents. And we are starting a, a new ser series, or actually revising, um, reviving a series called Gathering Voices, where we talk to um, uh, faith leaders, brilliant political thinkers, activists, and so on. And this is the first of that series. And we're so thrilled to have you join us for uh, the first of the Gathering Voices series. And we have with us as a, a guest for the conversation today, uh, Dr. James Zogby. I'm going to give only a some introduction of him. I'm going to have a few highlights, but keep it somewhat brief because I'm going to be asking him a bit of his background. And so I would like to uh, let him get to explain that to you. But uh, Dr. He is a Lebanese lick and he co-founded the Arab American Institute, a Washington DC based think tank, as well as a number of other peace and justice organizations in the US and uh -huh. organizations specifically uh, that support Arab American rights and Palestinian rights, um, which especially at the time that Dr. Zogby started working on Palestinian rights was a really challenging and uh, controversial issue to work on. And I'll be talking with him about that. Um, in 1993, following the sign, signing of the Israeli-Palestinian peace accords, which at the time gave people really great hope. Can't say they worked out to that degree, but um, were really hopeful. Uh, it was a really hopeful time. Uh, then Bright Vice President Al Gore tapped Dr. Zogby to help lead the Builders for Peace program to promote Arab American business in the West Bank and Gaza, because one of the many ways that the um, occupation of Palestine carries out is through um, economic hardship and on um, Israel. Under President Obama, uh, Dr. Zogby chaired the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Um, for both of Bernie Sanders' presidential campaigns, Dr. Zogby, Zogby was an integral part, and he um, has acted as a surrogate for Bernie Sanders. He's a renowned scholar on Middle East issues and the Arab American community. He is the author of the book, um, Arab Voices, What They Are Saying to Us and Why It Matters. And if you haven't heard of this book, it's um, a, an incredibly important book as it looks at, and it was, um, and it was first published in 2010. And it, at that time, it was really the first book to look at um, um, Arab viewpoints. And um, we will make sure to get a link to get the book in the chat. Between uh, in, in 1984 and 1988, he served as the deputy campaign manager and senior advisor to Jesse Jackson's camp presidential campaign, um, famously saying, I am the son of an undocumented documented immigrant, and I'm going to nominate for president of the US, the great grandson of a slave. Where else but in America could this happen? And with that, I want to welcome Dr. Zogby uh, to this conversation. Thanks, Ariel. Yeah, so if really we could glad start- to be here with everybody, and in particular, because I do a Zoom chat every Wednesday. I'm really pleased to see that folks are late getting on, so it's not just the Arab guys on my Zoom calls who are late. <laughs> so thank you for reinforcing that sense that we really all are one, one brothers and sisters under the skin. Thank you. And I will see that during this conversation and in a follow-up email that we get to you not only the link to purchase Arab Voices, uh, Dr. Zogby is also the author of a couple other books, which we'll get to, um, but also to join his weekly Wednesday coffee and column series, which I enjoy immensely. So, so Jim, I, I talked about, I, I said that quote of yours that I, I just <laughs> love from the Jesse Jackson campaign. And mm -hmm. there's two things about it. One, I'm... I'm would like you to tell us the story of your father, where he came from, and and um, his immigration story. But the other is the uh, what always strikes me about it is the optimism, right? The U.S. Mm -hmm. is such a 
racist, <laughs> racist country. And yet, um, and you have faced so much racist backlash, um, anti-Arab racism as an Arab American. And uh, yet during a campaign with Jesse Jackson, and I hear this so often from you, this, this optimism and this um, hope and belief in America. And so if you could talk about that as well, but beginning with that. Sure, my father's story was um, not unlike many Lebanese in that period. And what's not known is that we know the Armenian genocide. We certainly know the Holocaust. We know of several other uh, enormous tragedies, the Irish famine. What people don't know is that in the pre-World War I era, as a result, both of the allies blockading the sea, but then the Turks retaliating and blockading the mountain of Lebanon, um, half the population of Mount Lebanon died of during the famine there. Uh, the, uh, my grandfather uh, was able to take the family <coughs> out of the mountain into the Bekaa Valley where they were able to, uh, to farm and survive through the, the, the war, but, uh, but he died. Um, his youngest, his oldest son had come to America uh, before the war, he was 14. My uncle Habib left when he was 14 by himself. I still think about that. You know how amazing that was that somebody at, at age 14 could could do that. After the war, my grandfather had passed away. My grandmother brought the family back to the village, and they began to make plans to leave uh, to join Habib in in America. They all came. Uh, my father was uh, the first to leave, but he actually left. Um, and ended in Marseille, where he gave his visa to another woman uh, who was without a visa. You were able to do that back then. He think thinking that he'd get another one, but in the meantime, this anti-Syrian mindset. We were we were the shithole country back then. Da Senator David Reed in Pennsylvania said, um, "We don't want any more Syrian trash in America." Uh, they were uh, they were really viewed with great contempt uh, by uh, by the powers that be. Uh, he was unable to secure a visa, and so he did what uh, an enterprising young Lebanese guy would do. He got a job on a ship, uh, went to Canada, got off the boat, and uh, uh, crossed the St. Lawrence through the mountains and went looking for the family and was reunited a, a, a year or so later. Uh, I still have pictures of that. You know, When they first got together, uh, I heard the stories of how when people would come after him, he'd go into hiding. Um, it was... You know, it was an adventure for me at the time as I was growing up. It was like my father, wow, he did this and he did that. And as I became of age, and, and you know the, the story of the undocumented here, I never looked at them as anything other than heroes like my dad. I mean, he wanted so much to join his family and the family so much wanted to, to find opportunity in America, but they were willing to risk everything. He was willing to risk everything to do it. And, and he did. He got amnesty in the 30s, uh, became a citizen in the 40s. I have on the wall of my office the picture of, uh, not the picture, I have the actual, his certificate of, of, uh, of citizenship from 1942. And on top of that, I have my presidential appointment by President Obama, the parchment that the president gives. And uh, I, I point to that wall and I say, that's my American story. And with regard to the other part, uh, Ariel, you know, I, I write about this a lot. Um, there are two distinct ideas of America. Um, there is the promise of the lady in the harbor, give me your tired, your poor, your restless yearning to be free, etc. And then there's also the fact that in successive waves of new immigrants who came, they found bigotry, they found, you know, Italians were lynched and people, you know, <laughs> I think a lot about this, because I grew up in an Italian neighborhood. And, and, and today it's become politically correct to uh, it's Indigenous Peoples Day. And I agree, Columbus was not a good guy at all. But people don't remember that the start of Columbus Day was after the lynching of 11 Italians in New Orleans. Italians said, damn it, we need to rec people to recognize who we are. And so they, it was basically an Italian Heritage Day. Um, that, that sense of what happened to the Italians, what happened to the Irish, what happened to Jews, what happened to uh, Slovaks and Hungarians, Eastern and Central Europeans. I mean, it was contemptible. The bigotry toward every new wave of immigrants experienced the same thing. Not to speak of the fact that we were born with two original sins, slavery and genocide. Um, and so all that is part of our story. And, and what I say is that if you forget the one, the genocide, the slavery, the bigotry, 
you then fall prey to it in, in, in the future. But if you forget the other side of it, the fact that the lady in the harbor is still there, that people do come here for opportunity, that there are things possible here that aren't possible in the countries that they come from, and that waves of immigrants have succeeded in finding a place for themselves and for their families, and that great things could happen, that the that the son of a Kenyan could be elected president, that that my father could come undocumented and his son gets a PhD. And I remember when I sat with Al Gore after he appointed me and he was sitting in his office, he said, tell me a little about yourself. And I said, my father was an undocumented immigrant, came from a one room mud floor stone house in the hills of Lebanon. I'm sitting here with the vice president of the United States. That's my story. I know yours, but that happens in America. I mean, Barack Obama couldn't have been elected anywhere else in the world. My, I could not have been sitting in the office of the vice president or nominating somebody for president, given my story, anywhere else in the world. If you forget that, then you become prone to despair and you give up the fight. So I think that you have to remember both the dark side of America, but also the bright promise of America. And if you forget one or the other, you either become prone to the to, to repeat it again, or you give up hope and you stop fighting. And I don't stop fighting. That's me. <laughs> so that, that's actually the, that's actually the the, the way I tell. I, I like to to think about it. That you have to keep both in mind. So that's an excellent lead into my next question, uh, which is if you can talk about um, how you who your influences were and how you became involved in struggles for justice, so many different struggles. And, and I will say that um, you're a graduate of Loyola University in Syracuse, New York. Lemoyne, Lemoyne College. Lemoyne, sorry. sorry, yes, Loyola's in California. <laughs> right, well, we're in Baltimore or in Chicago. There's a lot of Loyola's. <laughs> Listen, um, the influences, it's my mom. To begin with, it was my mom, without, without a doubt. She was, um, somebody who was passionate about justice and um, and uh, was somebody fervent about, you know, I would be educated, I would treat others equally and fairly. And um, and she supported me in that. Um, she also cautioned me. I mean, a funny story about my mom. <laughs> um, my brother and I got involved in civil rights and anti-war stuff. And she, you're in school, you need to be focused on your schoolwork. You shouldn't be doing that. And we went to her 50th reunion, high school reunion, and little old ladies came up to her, Celia, did you ever tell your boys the story of, my mom so like, and when the story came out, it was, she had given the valedictory speech at her, at her high school in 1923. Um, <laughs> she got up on stage and ripped the speech because it had been written by the principal. And she said, this was, these words were written by a man, I'll speak for myself. And she spoke about women's rights. She was 17 in 1923. That's who she was. Uh, my father proposed to her when she was 19. She said, I'm not going to sit in the kitchen while the men are talking politics. And she said, no. And so she went to school. She got to manage the business. She worked. And uh, he came back to her when she was 38. And then she, she, he said, will you have me now? And she said, yes. So that was, that. I come by this, basically because of her. And I, one other story that, I, I, once you give me telling stories, I don't stop. Um, I, I remember I, I got into a, my, my rebellion, in other words, as a kid was not to go to the left because she already was there. I went to the right. So I got read Barry Goldwater, Conscience of a Conservative. I read Ayn Rand and I was like, government's taking our money and government's doing this. And I was preaching one, one day, sitting in the kitchen and she comes over and she looks at me. I mean, she was a short lady. She looked me in the eye. I was sitting down, but she was looking in the eye at me. She said, um, she said, if it weren't for the New York State Region Scholarship, you would not be in college right now. You'd be home working. And if it weren't for Social Security survivor benefits that we got because your dad died, my father died when I was young, you would be home working right now, supporting this home. And she said, do not deny to others what you take for yourself. It was like a slap in the face that shook it out of me. I wrote a piece uh, when Paul Ryan was running for vice president. And I read a story about how Paul Ryan had lost his father young, worked at McDonald's like I did, uh, and went to school on Social Security survivor benefits and a, and a state scholarship. And I wrote a piece saying Paul Ryan needed a mother like mine uh, to, to shake him out of his 
basically, basically conservative conservatism is a, a, a kind of an infantile um, uh, mindset. Of, you know, it's like, what about me? I, my money? I need my money. You can't take my money. And and you've got a whole bunch of people walking around with that. My mom passed away, but. Uh, my job in life is to keep her message alive. That was an early influence. Dan Berrigan at Lemoyne was clearly an influence. I mean, he was the one who took me first demonstration I went to against the war, first demonstration against civil rights. Um, they were powerful moments. Um, his prophetic voice was uh, was powerful and and influenced me. And then my wife, Eileen, I mean, I met her second day of school. We were together four years of college, got married, and we were together for 52 years. And as I say, she tempered my voice and my soul and made me the person I am today because I was like any punk. Um, I was harsh. She'd come to my speeches and she'd sit in the audience and I'd say things that were stuff you could say back in the 60s. And she winced like that. And It'd be a 10 win speech or a seven win speech. And I, <laughs> after a while, it got to the point where it was a no win speech. And she's like, okay, you're there now. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I remember you, you talked about my Jesse Jackson and surrogate work for Bernie. There was a, my wife had a stroke in November, 2019 and uh, January, 2020, while she was in the hospital, I got an asked from the Sanders campaign, he'd been invited to go to Greensville to uh, Martin Luther King Day uh, because um, uh, they were honoring Jesse Jackson and Bernie got invited to speak and he couldn't make it. So he asked if I would do it for him. And I and I, I went to Eileen and I said, I, I don't know, I don't want to leave you, whatever. She said, there's too many parts of your life all coming together here. You got to do it. So I went down there. And when I came back, I played the video for her. And she looked at it and she said, no winces. And so I, I you know, that, that was kind of like, I, I think that the three, um, the, my mom, um, Berrigan, uh, Eileen, I'd add Jesse Jackson, huge influence. Um, um, and, um, and my kids, I mean, look, you know, when you have kids, as, as you know, as, as those who have kids know, um, you become acutely aware of the importance of what you do and the importance of how they see you in terms of what you do and the world you're making for them, but also the image of, of personhood you're creating for them. You know, um, we have parents who act like younger and more adolescent than their children. And then we have parents who are so aloof and distant um, but the reality is that our kids learn to be who they are from us, like my mom did for me. Um, and I, I, all those things combined, maybe more of an answer than you, you expected, but the, all those things combined shape who I am. So something that uh, I think you missed in shaping who you are, uh, I'm going to ask you about. But first, I, I'm going to tell a brief story since we all tell stories just that uh, Jim and I uh, became friends by realizing that we both come from Utica, New York, and <laughs> such different backgrounds. <laughs> Jim is a Lebanese American, and my family as Jewish American immigrants, and um, early, early, early 1900s supporters of uh, the state of Israel, of, of early Zionism. Um, and it was it was through that Utica connection um, that that we met each other. But mm -hmm. I want to ask you about your your faith, and uh, I know mm -hmm. you shared that your faith with Eileen so deeply. And I want to ask what influences that has on your work, as well as as I know you miss some other influences as well. And so I'll get to that by saying, how did you um, both become involved in studying uh, in uh, working for Palestinian rights? And how did you come to earn your doctorate um, in in Muslim, uh, in Islam? Yeah. Um, um, look, I, I grew up Catholic. Um, Still, I'm Catholic. I mean, I, I I'm not one of those who say I used to be Catholic. I'm Catholic. Um, three big fights in my life. One is Israel Palestine. The other is reforming the Catholic Church, and the third is making the Democratic Party democratic and accountable. 
Um, and I'm, I seem to be losing all three, but, but I keep, I keep fighting them. Um, the, the Catholic church for me is, um, uh, is a conveyor of, of a message, uh, the message of Jesus Christ. And while there are those who have different interpretations of that, the scriptural Jesus, I know, um, as I, I gave a, a commencement address at, at my, my, my college, Lemoyne, um, which was kind of funny because I've been suspended senior year and the president who suspended me um, for some stupid stunt I pulled uh, was back again as president when they gave me an honorary doctorate and asked me to give the commencement address. And I walked out on stage and leaned over and said to him, I bet you never thought you'd see me here. Um, but I, I talked about Berrigan and I talked about Christianity as an ornery faith. Um, it's the one that says the last shall be first and the first shall be last. It's the one that says what you do for the least of these you do for me. Um, and, and I can't separate what I know about my faith from the influence of Daniel Berrigan and people like him. Uh, you, you can go to church and there are lots of Catholic preachers and, 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 and teachers um, who never touch on that ornery part of the message, the challenging part of the message. Um, but Daniel Berrigan did it for me. And it, it was it was transformative in terms of my thinking about myself, not just, I didn't just go to the left. I went to the left with a Christian inspiration for that. When I was in graduate school, um, I initially started studying patristics, the early Christian church, which fascinated me. Um, and in religions of India, Hinduism and Buddhism, up to the master's level, that's where I was. I had taken a couple courses in Islam, but Islam began to intrigue me. I mean, the professor intrigued me more than the religion itself, um, because it was essentially a Semitic faith in the context of the Abrahamic traditions. Uh, <laughs> Muhammad, the, the, the faith is grounded in that. And um, and uh, the teacher was so dramatic. The, the professors they had were so good that I ended up drifting into that and um, um, did a lot of work in anthropology. Got a, uh, After I finished my, my coursework, I went to University of Pennsylvania for a year and focused on Arabic language, but also anthropology with Anthony Wallace. Revitalization movements are what he taught, what happens to cultures under stress, what happens to religion under stress, um, and the movements that emerge um, in the context of people um, feeling socially, economically, politically dislocated. And I told Wallace at the time, I said, I, I want to do something with Black Muslims or maybe the Father Divine Religion in Philadelphia. He said, no, everybody's working on that. He said, you've got a background in studying Islam in the Middle East. Why don't you do something nobody's done? This is 1970. He said, why don't you do something with Palestinians? Uh, nobody's done anything on them. And really, nobody had. So the next year, I, my wife and I and our baby who was a little over a year old uh were on a plane to lebanon where i spent weeks in the refugee camps collecting stories and um and preparing to do a dissertation on palestinians and so if i have to talk about influences um a woman uh who i met in the camp a grandmother uh she uh had told me her story like everybody else did and i wrote them all down and i have the notebook still at my office she uh, she came to me and she said, um, she grabbed my arm and looked at me and she said, we've told you everything. You wrote them down. What are you going to do with us now? And I thought about that, you know, and the way home, I looked at Eileen and I said, our lives aren't going to be the same again, are they? And it, she haunted me. I, I wrote in my book, Arab Voices, that when you really listen to somebody, you end up with a responsibility to them. You have to pay attention to them because they've told you stuff. And that was, uh, for me, it was, uh, it was an important moment. And I came back, um, ended up writing my dissertation on the, on the Palestinians. Um, uh, I called it Arabs in the Promised Land, the Emergence of National Consciousness Among the Arabs in Israel. I wrote about them, the Arabs who stayed behind. Um, but then, you know, got involved in Arab American activity. And before you knew it, um, I was meeting people from the West Bank and meeting Israeli civil rights uh, folks, Felicia Langer, Israel Shahak, the mayor, former mayor of Nazareth, Taufik Zayed, and becoming aware of the enormity of the, the crimes committed in the occupation um, and started the Palestine Human Rights Campaign in the mid-70s. Um, 
And it moved to Washington, gave up teaching and said, this is what I'm going to do. And my, my wife was a brave soul who uh, we sold a house, packed up everything, took a big cut in pay and, and came to Washington to run the, the Palestine human rights campaign uh, where, I, you know, the fellowship reconciliation was an early endorser of, of the PHRC. I, I, I want to go back for a minute because my first <laughs> encounter with the fellowship was when I was in college, senior year, 1967. I was involved in uh, a group in Syracuse uh, that was called the, the Brothers Project. It was a project started by the fellowship nationally to bring wounded children over from Vietnam, uh, kids who had been napalmed for medical treatment here in the States so that Americans could make up for the damage we were done, doing to an entire society. Um, and that was my first encounter with the fellowship. Um, and so I, yeah, I do go kind of way back with them. And when I started PHRC, they were endorsers, early endorsers back in the seventies. You're on mute. Oh, geez. I'm going to have to let Ethan at some point get to ask you uh, more questions about the um, your involvement in the Brothers Project. Ethan is kind of our uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation historian, um, as we have a very long, long history, having mm -hmm. started in 1915. Uh, so, you know, I want to say that um, what we share, myself as, as a Jew and, and you as a, an Arab Christian, is that our faith guides us um, to work both for peace and justice at large and specifically um, for Palestinian rights. And that's uh, really the way that uh, we know each other is through that work for Palestinian rights and coming from very uh, different perspectives, right? Because I come from, um, I saw Anthony, my colleague, put in, in the chat that uh, a Jesuit friend uh, likes to say that for Catholics, the Catholic Church is your family, and sometimes you can't stand them, but you're, they're still family. <laughs> and uh, that's what the, uh, the Jewish community um, worldwide mm -hmm. is for me. Um, and we have some horrific uh, crimes against humanity that we as a people are, are actively committing. And so I come in. Oh, we never that. did as Catholics. We, 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 <laughs> we, we never did any of those. Well, uh, we, so, we were, we, hands are clean. <laughs> so along those lines, I know this was not an easy, you, you talked about, you know, Eileen was very brave, but it's much bigger than just taking a pay cut and packing up from, uh, packing up a home and moving to DC, taking on Palestinian rights, especially in the time when you did. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, my people can be some not nice people sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. It was a really hard path. And if you could talk about it, that, about it and, and what gave you the strength Look, to we continue got our first hard death threat. We got our first death threat on her birthday in 1970. Uh, Arab dog, you'll die if you set foot on campus again. Um, JDL attacked my classroom uh, to beat me up. Thank God there were <laughs> there were a number of young black kids in the class who <laughs> uh, defended me and chased them off. Um, but um, I death threats have been a constant. Um, my my daughter answered the phone. She was seven or eight or something all of a sudden started screaming and crying. We said, what is it? And she said, it's um, my stomach, my stomach. And we rushed her to the hospital. And at three o'clock in the morning, she finally told us that somebody had called, uh, had, and she'd answered the phone and they said, you know, use the F word and said, your, your father's going to die. Uh, we're going to kill him. And she reacted uh, the way she did out of absolute fright. Um, that was it. You know, look, and the death threats never stopped. My office got firebombed. The PHRC office got firebombed in 1980. Uh, Meyer Kahan uh, attacked my office, and uh, six months later, um, came to Washington. Um, and a colleague of mine, Alex Oda, was murdered by the F by, by the JDL. Um, I, it, yeah, it goes with the turf. And what also goes with the turf is something else that that I think is 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 important to note, and that is. You know, despite all the involvement I had in the civil rights and anti-war movement, when I, quote unquote, came out as the Arab um, at the 
anti-war rally, somebody would say, why are they, why are they letting the Arab guy speak? Um, and all of a sudden he became the Arab. I, I, I got to know Holly Mir, the, uh, the singer. Uh, and one time in late night chat, we were talking about how when she, when she first came out as a gay woman, how it changed her whole career. And I said, I, I know what that's like when, when you know, when I came out as, as the Arab guy, when I started to get involved in Palestinian rights, it changed everything. Uh, people, some people stopped talking to me. Some people stopped engaging. I lost some of my best friends um, and got fired from jobs. Um, and um, literally because I was the Arab guy. And so, yeah, I mean, I remember at our 50th anniversary, Eileen and I were, we had all the whole family there and stuff and we were talking about it. And she started by saying, I met this guy in college and he was cute and smart and I thought he was a cool guy. And we got married and then all of a sudden I found out he's an Arab. You know, it wasn't very popular to, to be married to an Arab. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a lot. Um, it was a lot. And she endured a lot. Uh, and, you know, um, and the kids did too. Uh, the kids did too. So um, it wasn't an easy, it wasn't an easy road to hoe. Um, and uh, don't get me started on that because that, it's not, you know, it, it uh, there is the pain. I mean, I, I somebody did ask me one time how I described my life, and I said like Sisyphus. You know, I'm, I'm rolling that stone up the hill, knowing it's fully certain that it's going to come back down again. You're going to be rolling it again. But what choice do you have? I'd say, you know, when you see that stone down there, and it, you know that it needs to get rolled, you push. I mean, what do you do in the face of injustice? What do you do in the face of challenges to to equity? What do you do in the face of human suffering? You do what you can do, um, and um, um, I, I, I feel sometimes I feel like if I had done become a doctor or, or a, you know, a physician, in other words, not a PhD, if, if I'd gone into business, like a good Lebanese guy, whatever, uh, if I'd done anything else, I might've had a different life. My family might have a different life. And sometimes I feel a regret. And I, I say to the kids, you know, if I had done this, then you would have had it, you would have, and they, they thank God they say back to me, no, I mean, we're glad you do what you do. Look at the opportunities that we've had, the things we've seen, the people we've got to know. Um, uh, it, it, yeah, it was hard. Um, I think about it a lot. Uh, um, and, and yet, you know, while I do have some regrets at times, I, I guess um, when I look at the end where we are, um, We've benefited from it. We we we've lived a life uh, as a family um, that is worth living. Um, and you know, my, my kids, Taufik Zayed, the mayor of Nazareth, um, they remember him as the guy that used to throw them up in the air, you know, to the ceiling and catch them. Um, uh, they remember prisoners when they would get out and come to stay with us, and they'd say they remember when they stayed at the house. They remember licking envelopes and stuffing them with letters uh, to people. Uh, asking them to protest this this uh, this injustice, um, they got brought up in the school, and uh, and and I think that was good. I think it was good, and I and I, I thank God that they feel it was good as well. So, and I, I, yeah, sorry. So I want to say it's it's not just um, your family that's benefited, but you've touched many lives um, for the better from here in the U.S. to uh, across the world. Well, and I know in your case, Ariel, you know, you brought your kids to the West Bank at very early kids and had them see firsthand. Um, and that makes a difference, you know, for them. And it makes a difference ultimately for how valuable your life is to them with the, the model that you've been for them. So, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. For for anybody who isn't familiar, um, I raised my kids in in traditional American Jewish community in many ways, attending Jewish summer camp and a um, URJ Reform synagogue, and as well um, when they were in between their bar and bat mitzvah um, ages, I took them to spend uh, three weeks um, in the West Bank, living among Palestinian families to to see the. Um, what our, what our people are doing with their own eyes, because as they say, and I, I, this is true of, of all injustices, that once you see, once you experience it, you, you never forget. You can never unsee when you have seen um, injustice.
You, you talked about rolling that uh, boulder uphill. And we're very much in that time rat right now, speaking of seeing injustices. And um, as I said, FOR has a very long history. We began um, so to support conscientious objection to World War I and then World War II and then Vietnam, the Vietnam War. And then we were heavily involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, one of these times we will have um, my colleague Ethan as a host to talk in detail about the fellowship's history. But you know, we, we've done many things. And so I'm gonna open it up to questions in a moment, but um, I want to begin first with my own question, which is the challenge to uh, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. What do you see for us? What do you see as our role in this movement and in this moment um, when Trumpism, when fascism, when so many forms of hatred are on the rise, both here in the United States and across the world? I've stumped you finally. Oh, is it me? <laughs> I thought you were asking them. No, I'm asking you. Oh, um, look, I, I, I um, uh, first of all, let me just, we're, we're talking about role model. Um, when I, and we mentioned the, the, the Brothers Project, um, that idea of bringing wounded kids for treatment is what inspired me to create Save Lebanon in 1980 two and three, um, I see my brother is, is on, uh, John was instrumental in, uh, in helping to, to mobilize for that project. We brought at, at the end 67 kids from Lebanon and we uh, uh, brought them to hospitals across the country. Um, they were housed in communities. They had a huge impact on the communities that they came, and we had a huge impact on their lives. I mean, some of those kids have, you know, have, have lives now that they would not have had had it not been for the the the, the work that was done to to give them eyes, to reconstruct their faces, to give them limbs, to to heal their wounds, um, and that came from the Brothers Project. That that's where that idea came from for me. Um, uh, but the fellowship, look, the, the fellowship's always been from the A.J. Musty, from Norman Thomas, from, you know, going back to the beginning. It's always been in the forefront of nonviolence and, and leading nonviolence. And I, I think the, 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 the sense that I have is that uh, there are so many areas today where the, the conversations that the fellowship can have, the action agenda it can develop, can be so instrumental. Here at home, for example. Um, uh, we have, I remember in the Arab community, we had a problem with Arab grocers in the black community. Uh, we brought together people in dialogue. And when, when people got to know each other, uh, it made, it was transformative. I mean, the Arab guys had no idea about the black community. They were new business there every day, but they were victimized by the stereotypes that they had inherited from the broader culture. And while the black community saw the Arab grocers, they saw them as exploiters. They didn't know their story. They didn't know that these guys who they saw as exploiters were Palestinian refugees who'd come over here with two nickels to start a business and try to live a life. Getting them to communicate with each other was huge. And uh, you know when I met uh, uh, Galen Hagler, uh, Hagler at, your, at your event um, and we're talking about police, I thought, what, what an amazing conversation to have between police and communities, between black police and the black communities, to begin to have a conversation about this is how we perceive you, this is how you are are are, are manifesting yourself in our presence. It, it's an it, it could be a, it could be transformative. Uh, I think um, I, I'm I'm not at the point of Arab Jewish dialogue. It's been tried and whatever, and it's it's not it's not working. But there are areas I think domestically like the gun violence issue um, that needs to needs to happen. Um, and, um, and, and getting people to tell their stories, um, especially with people who need to hear that story, um, I think can be, can be important. Um, right now we're in an era where we're not talking to each other, we're talking at each other. I mean, school boards, it's just, I mean, think about what would happen if, I mean, we saw an issue just of gay rights, right? We saw something happen in 20 years that had never happened in our history on any social movement at all, right? I mean, we went from 
one way to another on gay rights. And now there's a pushback. Um, what about conversations about uh, the kids, um, the kids who have gender identity issues, the kids who want to talk that through um, with some of those school boards who are denying them the opportunity to live full human lives, who don't recognize their humanity. I mean, I think we can think of the number of levels where communication doesn't exist, where the fellowship can develop an action agenda that can in fact uh, cross those boundaries and, and, and set up uh, uh, education awareness programs. You don't need to bring wounded kids from Vietnam. We got wounded kids here. We got wounded kids in the black community, we got wounded kids in the gay, lesbian, trans community. We got, we got you know, wounded kids everywhere um, and, and they need to be talked to and understood and, um, and have their stories told, not to those who already agree with them, but to those who are victimizing them because they don't get them. Um, and uh, the church networks you have is a great place to start. I'm, and that, if you ask me what my, what my ideas are, that, that's kind of where I'd, where I'd put my, 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 my ideas forward. Thank you for that. And uh, all of us <laughs> FOR community on this call, um, let's take this as, as a call to action. Um, as a call to to do the the work, the prophetic work that that we have long been called to do, mm. and uh, we're going to begin to take some questions now. And uh, Ethan, if you could read out um, a question from the chat or so. Sure. Thank you, Ariel, and uh, what a pleasure to be with you, Dr. Zoggi. Thank you for these. Amazing stories, and I certainly have questions of my own, but we've got uh, some good um, questions coming up in the chat, and um, <clears throat> one of them is um, related to your decades of work on, uh, in terms of Palestinian rights. Um, one of our audience members asks, are Palestinian rights groups with, within Israel under more repression now than in the past? And if you would want to comment on kind of what you've seen over the course of 50 plus years and, and how that is taking place at this time. Look, I, I think that uh, if, I, if I look to the Arab community in Israel itself, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, um, they are going through some growing pains right now. Uh, and uh, have politically matured, but are also as politically matured parties are going through some splits and divisions. But it's a very sophisticated conversation that they're having with each other. And I think with Israeli society in general about the role and the rights and the, the place basically of Palestinian citizens in, in, in Israel from the Jewish state law to um, the, the nationality law to um, to a broad range of civil rights issues. I, 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 I remember the really bad old days of the occupation um, from, uh, from 67 to the, the, the early, the late seventies, the first intifada, um, collective punishment, widespread torture, widespread um, uh, deportations. I mean, they'd put bags over people's head and throw them across the border. They deported maybe 16, 1800 Palestinian leaders, mayors, educators, etc. Uh, given all that, um, I, I probably think it's worse today than it was uh, back then. Um, and it's worse today because um, basically because of America. <laughs> I mean, we have given Israel such a, a free hand um, that they operate with impunity and um, they can get away with murder and they basically do it. Uh, the amount of land that has been seized, uh, the number of homes that have been demolished, the free reign given to settlers uh, just last week, uh, 40 new um, pasture lands were created and the government would take land, the Israeli government takes land and calls it state land for military and security purposes. And then after a decade or so, turns it over to settlers for, um, for their use. Um, and these pasture lands were necessary for Arabs uh, to 
be able to herd their 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 sheep and now they're denied because they're now exclusively under the control of Jewish settlers those kinds of things and the shortages of water of power uh, they had a fight to get 3g um when the whole world is working on 5g and maybe 6g um it it is it, it is criminal what is being done <clears throat> and it, and that's only the west bank gaza is worse because you have an entire people under a strangulation uh, an economic strangulation that at, at some points evaluates the amount of caloric intake necessary to survive and limits food imports to meet those criteria. Uh, they don't, you, you ain't getting fat in Gaza. Uh, you're surviving. And it's an open air prison. <clears throat> when they demonstrated at the border, the Israelis shot um, scores of kids, killed them. And when they would say in the American press, well, they did it because they were threatened because the kids were throwing stuff. The snipers were 300 yards away and these behind bunkers and these kids were nowhere near them. I mean, I thought, I, I said at one point, joking, it's not a funny matter, but if these kids could hit them from 300 yards, sign them up for a football or baseball team here in the States because that's pretty amazing. Um, so no, I, I, I think Ethan, the situation is in many ways worse today than it ever was. Because even back then there was hope and a horizon. There isn't one now. People had a sense, we'll get a state. We need to fight for a state. Settlements can be removed because there were only 40, 50, 60,000 settlers. Now there's 650,000 settlers um, chewing up the entire territory, carving it into cantons so the best palestinians can hope for is to live in little closed circles where the israelis own the land around the circle and they are squashed into this into this bantu stand type existence and it is the result of america allowing israel to do it supporting them blocking any any international effort to sanction them and the result has been impunity israel now feels i can get away with anything i want to do so why not and human nature being what it is they take advantage of that there's been a lively continuing chat um, uh, from a number of our audience members and certainly picking up on what you were just saying. Um, uh, Rosemary Pace from Pax Christi, New York State, asked the question, is there a way to change the unconditional support of Israel from the U.S.? Do you well, want to I think it, it's, it, it, it is not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so optimistic as to say it's happening, but certainly the number of members of Congress today who are willing to speak greater than it was any time in, in, in my early years. I mean, we had seven, eight, nine. Today, there's 30 to 60, depending on the issue. Um, the progressive voices that have risen up in Congress and uh, the fact that, you know, Shireen uh, Abu Akla, who the Palestinian journalist who was murdered by Israel, says the AP and the New York Times and the Washington Post and, and everybody else who's done research on it, Israel says we may have done it, but accidentally, and it was mistaken, but it still could have been a Palestinian, we're not sure, or whatever, uh, and the US gives them a pass on it. That's an American citizen, and they do nothing. Uh, and you've got members of Congress now really pushing hard on that issue. I think that's great. We need more of it. And we need to beat a couple people, a few more people in Congress. I mean, look, I, I remember when Pete McCloskey, who was a Marine Colonel, ran for Congress in the 60s and defeated Shirley Temple Black. Um, the Shirley Temple, her married name was Black. The little child star, everybody thought it was impossible. Pete ran against the war in Vietnam. And when he did, when he won, people in Congress were like, oh my God, you mean I can lose on that issue? And it did that combined with the anti-war movement was transformative. I think we're reaching a tipping point on this right now. Uh, we've had, you know, look, uh, you know, you, you've had, uh, APEC spend almost $30 million in the primaries, $6 million to beat um, a, a, a Black woman here in um, uh, in Prince George's County, um, uh, $3 million almost to defeat Cori Bush, $2 million against Rashida, um, uh, four, almost $5 million to defeat uh, uh, Andy Levin in Michigan, um, four plus million to try to defeat Summer Lee. They won some of those and they've lost some of those. Uh, they're crowing about their victories. 
I think that the, our victories are as important because they say to people, you can win on this issue and you can defeat them on this issue. And we need more of that. Not a super PAC. I don't, I don't want to see us raising 30 million to go, but rather to build a movement for justice and get into some campaigns that actually make a difference and can win. And I think that we're, we're at the point where you know, we're, like I said, at a tipping point where I think it's, it's that we're making progress on this. Just got more, got to do more of it. Absolutely. They have the money, but uh, so we, rather than countering with money, must come with prophetic voice and must come with the depth of, of our hearts and our determination. And I, I want to call it a thanks. I see we have uh, joining us uh, Rabbi David Cooper of Kahila Synagogue in the Bay Area, who himself has uh, traveled to the West Bank to be part uh, parts of um, uh, nonviolent civil resistance alongside and in solidarity with Palestinian activists. And so it, it is this kind of solidarity and it is these kinds of voices that um, that, that ha they give a balance to, to the massive amount of money that we are often up against. Before we ask your, uh, before I let Ethan, Ethan ask the next question, uh, we try to end after an hour, which would be five o'clock, but I see this is like such a rich conversation. So I wanna ask if you have an extra 10, 15 minutes, or if you have other obligations. 10? <laughs> you said 10? 10, yeah. All right, yeah. we're gonna give you 10, but then it's a, I'm just letting everyone know it's a hard, end at 10 at, at uh, 5 10 um and i also want to give time for you to give um your information for for how to follow you and ask you questions and join you um your coffee and column and with that i'm just going to hand it back off to ethan real quick thank you ariel um well it's, as i said we have a lot of uh, conversation in the chat that continues to build off of your comments on palestine and israel um i, I want to also bring back in um, some of the many rich stories you shared with us and, and the fact that you write a regular column. Um, and I wonder if you'd like to um, talk about this week's column, um, Without a Vision, the People Perish, and maybe connect it in some ways. I mean, it's a particular powerful story that you share in the framework, but also maybe connect it, um, uh, what, what you're offering there to, um, uh, you, you talk about um, PLO, um, uh, President Yasser Arafat, um, um, and uh, a moment where he is really framing, um, uh, I think you say, communications and power as these two core concepts. And I think you you you, you share that Mahmoud Darwish comes into the room at the time that you're hearing that from um, Arafat, and 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 he says vision is the other piece that needs to be uh, added to that. And it seems to be a really interesting framework for what you were sharing earlier about our U.S. political context and the hyper-partisanship and communication and power seeming to be so central mm -hmm. to kind of how politics is playing out here. So I wonder if there's a piece that you would like to really frame this article, which we'll put into the chat, um, in the context of... Yeah, we talked about it last week on my coffee and column, so I might tie together what Ariel was saying with what you're saying. Um, I do a weekly column, been writing it since um, February of 1992. So it's over 30 years now of, of a weekly column. And um, uh, what I've been doing since COVID is a weekly chat with people who read the column or who get the column, uh, who join in and we spend just a half hour uh, as I talk about what caused me to write it and in the chat, we get questions and conversation among people. Um, and it's it's fun. They can get the column and they can actually join the chat if they write J-Z-O-G-B-Y, J-Z-O-G-B-Y at AAIUSA.org. Um, I'd love to have them, I'd love to have them join in. Uh, we we constantly want to grow the number on that. And it's and it's uh, it's up my enjoy. I like telling stories, right? Um Anyway, the, the column was called Without Vision, the People Perish. And it uh, just re retell that story a little bit. I was there in Tunis to meet with Arafat to talk to him about Builders for Peace. And I was told um, your meeting would be at two o'clock in the morning, which is normal for Arafat. And uh, um, 
I get there and he's on the phone with his guy, as he put it, in Cyprus, who was connecting him with his people in Lebanon. And he got off the phone and he said to me, Jimmy, you see, I talk to my people every day, every day. It's key. And he said, I have more weapons in Lebanon today than I had back in 82, which I had argued with him about in previous conversations about how the intervention in Lebanon was stupid and it was fatal to Palestinians. Uh, but he was boasting about that. And he said to me, you see, he said, power in reserve and communications, the key to leadership. And just then, the famous Palestinian poet, just a, a, an absolutely remarkable human being, Mahmoud Darwish, comes in and he says, Mahmoud, I'm telling Jimmy, the key to leadership, power in reserve and communication, isn't that right? And Mahmoud said, envision, sir. And Arafat went like this, ah, not important. And I, 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 I never told that story before, but I thought it important to do it now because it, it's almost a, a metaphor, a parable or a metaphor um, that, that talks about the Palestinian plight. Power and communication, no vision, and where do you go? Um, Arafat did have a kind of a vision, but a strategic vision was missing. A strategic vision is not an idea, a state, a secular state, a national idea. A, 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 a strategic vision is, here's the goal, and here are the steps to get to that goal that take into consideration the political realities with which you're dealing. They never had that. I mean, the best they have, even today, I mean, we're going to go to the United Nations and get a vote. We're going to go to the international. I mean, those things are nice ideas, but international legitimacy is not a strategic plan uh, because nobody gives a shit about international legitimacy. If they did, we never would have invaded Iraq and Russia wouldn't be in Ukraine and the world wouldn't be going to hell. Um, so the, 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 the point, I think, is that so we had that discussion last week. We're going to continue it this week, tomorrow. Um, because so much rich conversation started that I feel a need to continue it. So if people want to get into that conversation tomorrow, please join write Jay Zogby at AAIUSA.org, and we'd be happy to add you to the to the list. Um, um, We've also put the link to um, to register for coffee okay. column tomorrow. Great. There's a link in the chat. And we'll put it in again just to uh, double confirm that everyone has it. We're going to take one more question and I'll turn it over to Ethan in a minute. But before we do, um, I want to say that next month, uh, Dr. Zogby mentioned uh, Reverend Graylin Hagler, who we at the Fellowship of Reconciliation are honored to be working with. Um, will be the next person we will be in conversation with. Um, that will be next month. I uh, will put the date in the chat and we will reach out to all of you. And we'll also put um, an article from Reverend Hagler in the chat so people can get excited about next month's conversation, which will uh, really mesh with the conversation that we are having today and especially with what you Jim were talking about in terms of racial justice here in the US countering white supremacy and mm -hmm. and bringing communities together to talk rather than spout um, rhetoric and yell at each other so uh, that will be next month on the third Tuesday of the month at four o'clock, because we'll be continuing this every third Tuesday of the month at four o'clock. And with that, let me give it to you, Ethan, to ask uh, the final question. Thank you. Um, and uh, as having spent a uh, few significant years of my childhood in Syracuse, New York, I got, just got to say I'm just <laughs> so excited about these connections. Um, uh, I want to pick up on that, um, looking ahead to Reverend Graylin Hagler next month and what you were sharing about policing, and ask if you want to, uh, uh, there's there's in the chat uh, questions about the connections of policing between the United States and Israel, and if you would uh, want to name any of those um, related to the uh, issues of uh, Israeli, uh, the IDF and, and uh, U.S. policing forces. Yeah, I mean, look, I remember when... Um... When Ferguson happened, my wife and I were at home watching television and I saw the tanks driving through the streets and these guys in, in the, the decked out the way they were. It looked like an occupation army. 
moving in, um, our police have become militarized. And uh, as a result, um, it's not officer friendly anymore. It is an occupation army is what it seems like and feels like. Um, that said, that, that I think is a discussion that needs to be had. And one of the factors here, not the sole factor, but one of the, one of the factors is the Pentagon just dumping stuff uh, so they can get more stuff. Um, but one of the factors is that Israel has been conducting training sessions of American police. I remember one time was, uh, there was a cop car and he was coming down the street, was lights on, he wasn't going anywhere. And when I stopped him, I said, what's the lights on for? He said, oh, we learned to do that. It creates a sense of, of urgency and panic. You know, people like pay attention. Um, and that's one of the things they learned in Israel. And he actually told me that. That was one of the things they learned in Israel. That was a, it was a good thing to do. Um, it, it, I'm not for the defund the police, but I'm for bringing the police back to the community and have it in relationship with the community uh, to create an officer-friendly environment. Um, and that's going to require a lot of undoing from where we are today. Uh, um, uh, but but uh, um, but I, I was so pleased that um, uh, JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, started a program to challenge local police departments uh, about the, sending their their officers and and leadership to Israel for training programs. They they don't have anything to teach us. I mean, they, they're an occupation army. Um, and if we want to become occupation armies, then that's the place to go to learn how to do it. They've been doing it for a long time. But if we want a different relationship between community and police, Israel's not the place to be to be to be going. And so I really supported what JVP was doing, and I think it's something that everyone needs to support. Um, it is not it is not something to do. I, can I just do something before we get off? We've got please, please. I was going oh, to tell brother, you. Please give us brother, your final thoughts. My brother is 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 there, and if if John doesn't mind, I I can't I can't well, be looking at him the whole time and not asking him to say something because. Well, and before you before you ask him, I'm just going to interrupt and say that um, I really appreciate uh, John so much um, because John, we at the Fellowship of Reconciliation, our, our International Fellowship of Reconciliation, we're holding our quadrennial uh, conference this November. And for the first time ever, it will be on the African continent in the uh, country of South Sudan, a very, very intense country. And um, John Zogby gave me and my colleague, uh, Chris Ney, his, his time and attention to talk to us about South Sudan because he has worked there for peace and connected us to further people to talk to. And I, I just want to uh, thank you uh, as well for that. Well, while uh, you're I, more, I'm glad you connected. Thank you. Hey. I'll turn it back over to you, Jim. Well, I, I, look, I mean, it's, we talked about influences on my life. That, that That's one right there. Um, he, uh, uh, John, John in his polling made my, I remember one time I was pulling out of a parking lot. Uh, Eileen and I were up in, in Syracuse and we pulled out of a parking lot and the guy looked at my license. Uh, he said, you're Zogby, you're a Zogby. I said, yeah. He said, I thought that was something like post or catalog, like a, a just a brand. <laughs> and I said, well, they were family names too. And, and Zogby is a family name. It's my brother. Wow. He was like, you, yeah, I mean, he made, he made our family name a brand. Um, and, uh, uh, he's still the best pollster around and one of the great analysts of American presidential politics I know um, from the time he was four when he had all the presidents back and forth and knew all the vice presidents and um, I brought him a show and tell in school I brought in my brother to uh, <laughs> to 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 show how impressive he was with his knowledge of the presidents uh, and he's only gotten better and smarter as he's gone along. Anyway, thank you, Ariel, and thank you, uh, Ethan, and and the and the rest of you. Um, I, I appreciated the chance, and and I'm so pleased that many of you stayed on and listened through all the stories that I had to tell. Um, it is uh, um, it's it's a delight to be with you. And if you want to join me tomorrow on Coffee and Column, I'd love to have you. Um, so thank you, and uh, and thank you, John, for staying with it the the whole time, and. Uh, <laughs> I hope to see you all. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining us, Jim. And a thanks to my colleagues on this call, Susan, Ethan, Bill, Anthony, and more. Thank you, John, and as well. And hope to see you all at Coffee and Column tomorrow.
ביי ביי.